Next up is Jonathan Whitlock from NTNU, and he will have a talk on neurophysiology and behavioral analysis. Cool. Um, is my screen sharing? Is that looking okay? Looking good. We're looking good. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I, I, I come as an ambassador from, uh, from, from neurophysiology. It was really comforting and, and fun to see the previous talks where the focus is more about you know, the application of the technology as opposed to the technology itself. Um, because <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a consumer of, of AI. I don't develop myself. And by AI, I mean, broadly speaking, uh, a whole family of like uh, different machine learning tools that are out there now. So I'll talk a little bit about how we apply this in, in, in my line of work, specifically in my lab. And at the end, I'll, I'll give a few slides about how really like the, uh, the field as a whole is, is really benefiting hugely from um, advances in, uh, in uh, for example, computer vision, uh, pose estimation and, and the like. So the, the overarching goals, just most broadly speaking of behavioral neuroscience is to understand natural behavior um, of, of any animal, if it's a human or a monkey or a rodent, uh, to understand behavior without perturbing it. And at the, other, at the same time, you wanna understand systems level neural computations. So how, you know, what, what the brain is doing. And you wanna put these elements together, the understanding of the brain and behavior together. Uh, so that you can build a more accurate model of, of how the brain generates behavior. You understand how behavior and experience and social interactions and whatnot, you know, feedback and shape the brain. And then in, 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 in the longer run, the longer sort of like over the horizon idea is that, you know, this will equip us to uh, generate, you know, more better on-target treatments, for example, of pharmacology um, or pharma pharmacological interventions, for example, with uh, psychiatric disease, right? Um, so more specifically, what, what, what my lab is interested in studying, one of our motivating questions is how does the brain coordinate action in, in space? And so what, why is this an interesting question? So it's an essential feature of daily life, uh, not just if you're learning to um, uh, uh, play baseball or basketball or what have you, but um, you know, you, 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 you're, you know it's, it should seem intuitively obvious, right? Your, your brain is constantly driving your body and coordinating your body. Uh, for, for any number of actions that you do throughout the day, right? It's, it's, it's a continual job. Uh, so it's an essential feature of life. All animals do it. So any animal that has a body and a nervous system, um, which is most of life, um, you know, has, has a brain that has to drive a body. And so in this case, the animal uh, is reaching through a narrow, narrow slit, it's grabbing a pellet, pulling it in and eating it. And this is from a, a series of experiments where we were recording neural populations in the animal's cortex and then relating this, relating the patterns of activity back to the animal's behavior and seeing how the cortex organized the, uh, the, the, the representations for the animal's actions. And again, the, the, the more that we understand these things, um, uh, for example, uh, we can build uh, a better prosthetics, uh, we can build uh, uh, robotics, uh, robots that, that move better. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the, the basic idea. Um, uh, uh, the motivation for my group's work. And I'll, I'll just say that there, there's really two dominant approaches uh, over the decades that have sort of guided the study of, of uh, the uh, behavior in the brain. So the older one, and it's been incredibly productive uh, over the decades, is using very strict control and studying very simple behavior. So in this case, the animal's head fixed, it's sitting in a chair, it's head restrained, there's a microdrive that's recording cells uh, from the animal's uh, part of the brain called the posterior parietal cortex. And the animal's responding to various visual signals and it's reaching out to certain spatial locations and it's performing specific actions. Um, so the behavior here is very restrained, but it's, you know, it's very precise, it's very repeatable. Um, and this technology is improved. Now it's possible to use a markerless tracking or to fit lots of markers on an animal's arm and study uh, you know, with great precision the, the trajectory of the, of the movement through 3D space, right? So that's one camp. The other camp is to um, basically record less of the animal's behavior. So you have less control over the animal's behavior, uh, but you can let the animal behave naturally, right? So in this case, you have a miniaturized drive that just weighs a couple of grams that's fitting on a, a mouse's head. Uh, so the animal can carry the drive around with it as it's behaving and, and doing what it does. 
Um, you can target those electrodes to wherever you want, whatever area of interest in the brain uh, you may seek. And here's just an example video of this kind of approach where, the, again, the animal's running freely, it's just that less is being tracked. That's the point here. And um, the cell I'm going to show you is, is from the animal's brain region called the hippocampus. This is called a uh, place cell. So if you can hear the popping, it's that the cell fires whenever the animal is in that northwest corner of the box. Which is really cool to see play out in, in, in real time. But you, you see the, the spikes are going off in the northwest corner of the box, but the thing is you, you don't really have a view of, of, of the animal's behavior. It's changing, it's, it, it, it's sniffing around, it's turning, it's curling its body, it's stretching out. You lose all of that information uh, when you simplify the account of the animal's behavior, right? So you have this kind of like give and take, all right, between uh, control versus freedom. And my group has been working for some years to try to kind of fill that gap, fill that middle ground um, by recording from free to behaving animals, but tracking them in 3D, right? So this is the work of my, uh, for one of my first PhD students, Bartul Mimica, my first postdoc, Ben Dunn, who is now um, uh, associate professor up in the math department. And so here we track the animals' backs and heads with retroflective markers, put a ring of, of infrared cameras up above them and track them at 120 hertz. And the data sets that we collect from the animals now, it's, you know, as opposed to the previous video where you just have one camera overhead, when you're using multiple cameras, you can zoom in on the animal's behavior. You can uh, recreate basically a behavioral session. You see the animal here has a, it has a head, a neck, and a back. And um, it just gives a much, much more intuitive kind of feel for, um, you know, what is the animal doing? What, you know, what's its actual behavior? Not just where is it, but, but what's the animal actually doing? So here's an example of the setup actually in action. So there are, uh, these are the markers you see floating in orange on the animal's back. The sound is, is very faint, but there's a faint popping that you hear. There's a picture of it. There's a cell up in the animal's frontal motor cortex that's being isolated. That waveform that you see corresponds to the spiking activity of a single cell. And here's the rat that's running around and, and, and freely behaving, right? They're marked up, they tolerate the markers pretty well. Um, <clears throat> right, so what this allows us now to do is instead of just looking at the animal's location, we can look at the animal's body posture. So the pitch of the head, the pitch of the back, neck elevation, back azimuth, head azimuth, head roll. So we, we have a much, much richer account of the animal's posture. And I'll show you an example now of, of uh, what I would just call like a right, a right turn cell. It's a very simple sort of moniker to put on it. So this animal is freely running around the box, but here for the sake of, of the um, uh, demonstration for the video, the animal's being held in place artificially, computationally, using a code we call Mr. Stuck Animals. Um, but I hope that you can hear the popping of the cell and that it's kind of obvious uh, when the cell is firing, what's going on with the animal's body. So, so look, looking at the animal using the old school kind of technique of just having the camera overhead, you might see that it corresponds to when the animal's running off to the right. But here in the video, you can see that it's actually, the, it's, it's not just the, the movement of the animal, it's the posture of the animal. And in fact, it's the posture that's the main explainer um, uh, that, that accounts for the variability in the cell spiking. So here's a, a, a tuning curve for the head azimuth of the animal. So the left, right displacement of the animal's head. So whenever the animal's head is, is turning off to the right, um, these colored dots here correspond to the firing rate of the cell at different points in time during the recording. And you see there's this really, what it's a very nice tuning curve where the, the peak of the firing rate is, is several standard deviations above the, uh, the null distribution, which is shown by the error bars down beneath. Uh, we see the same thing now for considering the animal's uh, back for the azimuth of the back, again, when it's turned off to the right. And we also see the same thing for the uh, animal's head roll. Uh, this cell also fired a little bit when the animal's head was rolled a, a bit to the left. And this all looks tidy and good, but then, you know, we got what we asked for, and it was a, a bit overwhelming because it was just this white wall of death of, of possible covariates that could explain the firing properties of these cells. Right, so um, 
So this was a bit intimidating and, and now you might be able to see, okay, there, there really is a need for statistical models and maybe someday machine learning uh, to make sense of all the data that we're getting. So we, for now, we, we, we tamed this, this so-called death by covariates using uh, generalized linear models or GLMs to uh, basically build a picture of how posture was represented in the brain. So, so looking at a part of the brain that, again, it, it deals with uh, coordinating the, the, the positioning of the body in space. Uh, for, for example, um, we've known since the 70s that parietal cortex is involved in controlling an animal's arm movement or eye position. And what we showed here in this study was that um, if you unhook the animal and let it run freely, actually most of what parietal cortex cares about is uh, the 3D posture of the animal's head. That you just you wouldn't know that you wouldn't see it unless you were tracking the animal in 3D. I uh, cared about other aspects of the body as well: the neck elevation, the uh, back posture. Um, some cells cared about all of these uh, all of these features altogether. And then there were the uh, the so-called un unclassified cells, which I kind of like because it means we need to track more, and uh, uh, there's more work for us to do. And <clears throat> I'll just say it's roughly the same story looking up at the frontal motor areas that parietal cortex connects with. And, and that's all well and good, right? And so if we have nice tracking and we have GLMs, um, you know, this, uh, this is about as far as we can get, but the, you know, no one wants to stop there. Um, so the idea is to really you know, get at the neural tuning to behavior itself, not just the physical attributes of behavior, but what was the animal doing? What was it doing, um, what was it doing you know, uh, one second ago? What's it going to do next? Can you build up generative models uh, based on the animal's time varying behavior and use behavior to predict behavior and also incorporate neural activity, see how the brain is generating this. So now we really need to rely on, on things like dimensionality reduction. Um, other labs are using machine learning based approaches to extracting time varying uh, behaviors from, from postural data. So um, I should also note that this is being spearheaded in my group by Claudia Battistin. Uh, who's a postdoc also in the math department uh, in, in Ben Dunn's lab. And so, so she takes the, the 3D pose data that we collect from the animals, um, it does a, a morelet wavelet decomposition to basically uh, take the different postural features and look at how quickly they're changing through time. Um, and uh, uh, to, to have a record for how each of the postural features is changing through time. Yeah, that's basically what you're doing with the, with the, with the wavelet decomposition. Then you take this decomposed uh, uh, time frequency data and you do low dimensional embedding like PCA, um, uh, something uh, you can also use nonlinear embedding, uh, T-SNE for, uh, for visualization purposes. And then you, you include watershed clustering and now what each of these different patches corresponds to is um, uh, it's a different behavior that the animal is doing. And this, this map is basically, again, it's, it, it's built out of time varying posture, right? So if the animal is, is reared up uh, high or scanning with its head up, or if it's preparing to rear, uh, these different behaviors are, are captured, they're embedded, and then you know, labeled uh, post hoc uh, by the experimenter. And now you can make videos of uh, all of these different behaviors uh, that the animals are doing. And so they kind of slow down a little bit when each of the identified behaviors pops up. So if the animal's rearing or if it's straight running, if it has its head turned in a certain way when it's walking. Um, and and to, to someone who studies behavior and who wants to understand how the brain generates behavior, this, this, this is huge. I mean, this, this really opens up a big door um, because now, we're not just taking a static image of the animal's posture and, and, and making a simple tuning curve, but now we can ask about how is the brain generating exact behaviors with pretty good precision on a moment to moment basis, right, when the animal's freely moving. And for decades, this is required that the animal is head fixed and doing this task that you usually, a very, something very artificial that you take weeks to train the animal to do. And now we can identify these individual behaviors, we can pull them out and look at the different brain networks that are generating them and see how they're working together, All right? So we can look at uh, uh, this in, in individual uh, freely moving animals. We can ask, uh, does it matter what task the animal was doing? Does, uh, does the animal's um, uh, behavioral syntax matter? Does, that, that means, you know, what, what was the animal doing before? What's it gonna do next? What's the context of, the, of this given action that the animal's doing? Uh, another thing I'd like to use this tool to study is, is the, the effects of, of social interactions between animals. 
So uh, this is very much uh, ongoing. And what I'll do now is, is, is kind of relate this type of work back to, to, to other work that's going on in the field. So um, deep learning, for example. Uh, so I was just talking about you know, dimensionality reduction techniques that were kind of stacked together one by one. Uh, but deep learning has been applied to successfully model human movement um, years, years ago, back in the 2000s. So these two videos um, that are playing up at the top are actually not videos of people, but these are the outputs of generative models. Uh, that were trained um, on a, a couple of hundred frames of human movement. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the joint angle information um, from human videos is, is, in this case, plugged in as inputs to a restricted Boltzmann machine. And the, uh, the joint angles as an animal, or an animal, as a person moves and walks, they vary through time. So the, the hidden nodes get trained up based on the, the uh, time varying joint angles that the person has as they, as they walk or move. And then the, the output of this, uh, of this uh, RBM is uh, the, the different types of movement that the person is executing, right? So if you look at the hidden nodes kind of stretched out through time here, um, you can just look at the pace at which the hidden nodes are, are, are changing and you can get a sense for if, if a person was doing a behavior at a moderate pace like walking, or if they were sitting still, uh, if they get back up and, uh, and so on. So this is an incredibly powerful tool. We actually wanted to use this in the first place um, for our animal data, but we found out that we could actually get away with using much, much simpler uh, techniques, which is what I showed on the previous slide. Um, uh, similar approaches have been used. This is from uh, Bob Dada's lab, uh, behavioral neurophysiology group at, at, at Harvard where uh, they were using simple depth sensors that were placed above an arena that has mice running in it. And you take the, uh, the outline of the mouse, the hull of the mouse, and you look how it changes during the course of uh, uh, just running around and exploring uh, in an open arena. Uh, you take the tracking data, do PCA on it. Uh, you feed the PCA output into uh, an, uh, an auto encoder and uh, you're able to extract individual behaviors, right? So. Uh, each one of these circles here corresponds to one of the different behaviors that was extracted um, from an animal behaving perfectly spontaneously. Um, and you can isolate them. And again, you can start to ask questions about what, what are the different uh, systems in the brain that, that, that work together to produce this kind of behavior, right? Um, and there's a continually growing zoo of machine learning methods for classifying behavior. So there were three different examples here, but there's many. Um, they've been developed in fruit flies, in mice, and in rodents, and some of the cool early stuff was, uh, was uh, originally done in humans. And um, the last thing I'll mention is, is in, in a parallel development in convolutional neural nets. Uh, they've gotten better. Uh, access to high-power GPUs and the like has been democratized. And this has really led to an explosion of, of markerless tracking tools. And so I'm showing some examples here from a tracking toolkit called Deep Lab Cut. It's one of the most uh, commonly widely available ones now, although of course there are many. Um, and the user basically just, you just label a, a few dozen frames uh, and the model learns to predict what it thinks your object of interest is and it can uh, track individual movements um, with very little training. So here's, again, here's a rat that's reaching through a narrow slit, grabbing a pellet of food. You can see that the different knuckles and, and digits of the animal's paw are labeled very nicely. Here's uh, an example of studying locomotor behavior with an animal that is uh, running on a running wheel. Um, there's a postdoc in my lab, Yernea, who is using uh, uh, head-mounted cameras so that we can track the animal's eyes and whiskers. And we're taking this markerless tra tracking data and actually piping it back onto the, uh, the 3D model, the 3D rat that I was showing before. Um, so now that thing has eyes and whiskers and we can start to study how it, it, it uses its, its sensory input to guide, guide its behavior to do that quantitatively. Um, it's possible to visualize collective behaviors, right? And so this is a hard problem to crack for a long time, which is that you have animals, this is a zebrafish that are swimming in a tank. For a long time, it was very hard to tell one animal apart from another, but again, things have improved. Um, and this allows you to look at the behavior, not only of one animal, but, but groups of animals. And this is a, a, a thing from, from Ian Cousin's lab at the Max, uh, Max Planck in Konstanz in Germany. Uh, it's called T-Rex, it just came out last month. 
And these guys even went so far with these different colors here to project what they think the, uh, what the animal is seeing, right? Based on, uh, based on the, the eye position of the fish. And as with many things, this fantastic collection of toolkits started with early work with people, right? So here's a, a, a video of a group of dancers. I think this was in Switzerland. Um, and uh, um, this was an early demonstration, I think, of a software called MoDeep. But since then, there have been uh, uh, Deep Pose and, and several other uh, convolutional uh, uh, neural nets that have been uh, developed over the years. As of 2020, there's more than 4,000 papers that have uh, been published on, on human post estimation. Right, so then uh, again, just to sum up the overarching goals for behavioral neuroscience is for the part about understanding natural behavior without perturbing it, with advances in tracking and machine vision and, and behavioral modeling, we're, we're, we're in the middle of kind of a renaissance uh, where we can track uh, more and more sophisticated features, you know, almost by the month. Uh, so it's a very, very fun time to be doing this. Um, and on the on, on, on the neuro on, on the, the brain end, uh, there's additional work that's going on with uh, uh, collecting ever larger uh, uh, samplings of population data and modeling that. So then these things can be brought together using dimensionality reduction, statistical modeling. Some groups are starting to use deep neural networks to unite behavioral and neural data sets. Um, and again, you know, this is done in the service of, of better understanding how the, uh, the brain generates behavior. Um, so thanks for your attention, and I need to acknowledge Ben and Bartul and Claudia who made the work possible for the work that I showed from, from my own group, and my funding sources the Norwegian Research Council and uh, the ERC. So thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. We have some uh, questions for you, and we will pick uh, two of them. Okay. So the first, first question is, what do you think of Elon Musk's Neuralink project? Uh, a, a short, a, a short answer for that is, um, I, I, you ask him, when's it going to get going? When's it going to get cool? And he says about ten years. And you'll ask him that in five years or ten years, and you'll ask him, okay, when's it going to get going? When's it going to get cool? And he's going to say about ten years. I think that, I, that I'll just leave it at that. We can discuss it at more length afterwards. But I think this is. I, I think that requires solving some seriously big problems that, you know, just, just hiring a bunch of engineers and throwing them at it is, is it, you're not going to figure out how their brain works that way. Unfortunately, it's, it's harder than that. <laughs> All right. The next question um, is, does the sensors on the rat's head affect its movement? Well, we want to, we, we, yeah, that's a great question, of course. Um, yeah, so, so we, we, we want to minimize that kind of thing um, as much as possible. Um, I, I mean, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, we would use the sensors to study how the animal uses its senses in, in different situations, if it's meeting a new animal or if it's, um, in a new room for the first time, or if it's if it's encountering an object that it didn't expect, and in my group is just starting with this. So now I'm quoting previous uh, 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 previous work. So so we have benchmarks that we'll be able to um, uh, compare our data up against to see just how natural the animal's behavior is. But I can say, particularly when you're using rats, which are um, as far as rodents go, are large. They have strong necks. Uh, they can actually tolerate the headgear quite well, and they will engage in, in chasing behaviors and social behaviors quite well. The only thing you have to watch out for is that if you have groups of animals together that they don't rip the stuff or start chewing on the, on the parts on the, on the other animal's head. But uh, mm -hmm. no, I mean, and I, you know, we can discuss this, this more in the forum afterwards too. Thank you, Jonathan. Great, thanks. Okay, I'll so uh, stop sharing my screen or... Let's see, let me come back here.